everyone, and welcome to today's live webinar broadcast hosted by Oregon OVO. My name is Tom Murphy. I'm the Director of Scientific Applications at Oregon OVO. We'll be presenting on two topics today pertaining to liver disease. Our first speaker, Dr. Jeff Ireland, will provide an introduction to bioprinted tissues and discuss liver fibrosis. He'll be followed by Dr. Alice Chin, who will present on non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience, we are broadcasting live and following the presentations, there will be a Q&A session offering you a chance to pose questions to our panelists. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time throughout the presentations by typing them into the questions pane of the control panel. We will collect the questions and address as many as we can uh, depending on the time. And with that, I'd like to introduce our two panelists. Our first speaker, Dr. Jeff Ireland, holds a PhD in molecular biology from the University of Oregon and has research experience in the field of cancer genetics and using genomic screening and drug discovery for target ID and characterization. As Director of Scientific Applications, Jeff interfaces with Organovo's customers and R&D team to implement and expand the company's portfolio of service offerings utilizing bioprinted tissue models. Our second speaker will be Dr. Alice Chin. She received her PhD in biology with an emphasis in developmental biology from John Hopkins University in association with Carnegie Institute of Washington, Department of Embryology, and has completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Harvard Stem Cell Institute. Alice joined Organovo to lead the development of in vitro human tissue models in liver and kidney for toxicology research and disease modeling. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff. Thanks, Tom, for the nice introduction, and thanks to you and the audience for attending today's webinar. I'm going to dive right in with an outline of where we're going to go today. So I'm going to start with a very brief introduction to Organovo and our XV3D bioprinted human liver tissues. I'll talk about the creation and characterization of an induced fibrosis model, and then I'll show some data on the use of the model to evaluate fibromodulatory compounds. Then I'll turn it over to Alice, who will uh, share with you some preliminary data on inducing steatosis via a nutrient overload approach, and as well the addition of Cooper cells and inflammatory inducers in the model to the nutrient load to lead, which leads to characterizations of NASH. Briefly, to, over, to give you an overview of Organovo, Organovo is headquartered here in San Diego, California, uh, well, well over 100 employees. Uh, we've been around since 2007 and public since 2013. Uh, we're really based on the, the core intellectual property of the patent portfolio surrounding the proprietary 3D tissue printing technology, but it's important to emphasize that we have core expertise not only in the 3D bioprinting of the tissues, but as well as uh, designing those models and uh, in the laboratory services area. And one thing I'd like to note is the proprietary 3D tissue printing platform is an area of constant innovation. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to work at Organovo and, and witness the synergy between our engineering and biologist uh, teams to uh, continually improve the process. But for the work we're going to talk about today, the way our customers and part partners access these, these disease models uh, and also uh, some of the um, work we do in the area of preclinical safety or ADME, is through a services model. So customers will send us their test articles, uh, will uh, create and treat the tissues, uh, do a lot of analysis in-house, and in the cases where we don't have in-house capabilities, we may share some, some reagents generated from those treatments. Um, as well, we do work with partners on custom tissue development, uh, creating new uh, versions of the tissues or completely new tissues. And finally, I'd like to point out that we have a really uh, nice area of work here that's very exciting, which is developing these in vitro tissue models uh, for therapeutic purposes, ultimately to put them into patients. So today we're going to talk about how we can use these in vitro tissue models to address uh, some of the problems in the area of non-alcoholic fatty li liver disease. Um, and what we'll show is that we can induce some of the uh, relevant phenotypes in our tissue. So I don't have to educate, I think, any of the experts in the audience about the severity of this issue or problem, uh, a high percentage of U.S. adults are on the spectrum for NAFLD, and a large fraction of those uh, fatty liver patients will progress at some point to NASH, non-alcoholic steatotic steatosis, steat hepatitis. And so this is predicted to become one of the leading causes of end-stage liver disease in the coming decades. And the real key here is that uh, clinical biomarkers and therapeutics are lacking in this area. 
So there is a need for improved preclinical models that reflect uh, human biology. And so we like to uh, refer to this quote from James Bertrand, once we get rid of traditional thinking, we can get on with creating the future. So in a very simplistic way, um, the way we complement the kind of data that you may be getting out of your current models, uh, sort of mapped onto the very simplistic linear drug discovery um, pipeline is that, um, and, and we're not the only ones doing this, there's quite a lot of work uh, in the area of, of advanced models uh, in the in vitro space that, that are designed to address some of the issues with either uh, cell-based models, so even very sophisticated cell-based models that might be comprised of primary cells or mixtures of cells don't always recapitulate uh, tissue level phenotypes. Uh, their uh, cells are not in the, in the normal context that they are in, 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 in the patient. And as well, we all know that animal models uh, have great value, but they don't always recapitulate human genetics and, and human physiology. So we feel like the in vitro tissue models that we are uh, creating, uh, while they won't necessarily completely replace the, the standard models anytime soon, uh, they do offer complementary information that will allow our, our customers and partners to make uh, more informed decisions along each of these stages in the drug discovery uh, or biomarker discovery process. So I'm going to briefly go over uh, the bioprinting process, how we create our tissues. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, on our website are a number of uh, recordings of earlier webinars, and the first of those goes into some more technical details on, on how this is accomplished, so I can refer you uh, to, to look at that if you're uh, interested in, in more of the in-depth um, details about how we create the tissues. But uh, the key here is that we start out with human cells. For all the data we're going to talk about today, those are primary human cells. Uh, but the bioprinting platform is cell agnostic. We can print with uh, engineered cells, iPS-derived cells, uh, normal or disease cells. And uh, what we do with those cells is we formulate into what we call a, a bioink. Uh, that's comprised of a, a cell type. Uh, it could be a single cell type or a mixture of different cell types, a proprietary media formulation. Uh, and we'll often give those uh, cell mixtures a temporary matrix. Uh, that's just a way for the uh, bioprinted tissue to hold together after it's initially created uh, to give the cells time to form their own extracellular matrix. And that uh, temporary matrix is engineered to be displaced over the course of a few days of culture. So just to reiterate that uh, bio ink can be comprised of uh, uh, up to 100% cellular material or a mixture of cells and cells uh, and, and matrix. What we then do is uh, we place the, the bio ink in, in, a, in a printer head onto the bioprinter platform. Uh, the current uh, version of the Bioprinter has four print heads. I think you can see them in this image. Uh, that gives us the ability to, uh, in theory, print uh, four different mixtures of cells with different um, modes of deposition. The key here is that a lot of engineering goes in to make sure that the bioprinting process is biocompatible, that we don't harm the cells. And the real key here is that the bioprinter platform gives us spatial control. So the way these tissues are created is they're um, iteratively, these bioinks are iteratively deposited. So we build the tissue from the ground up, very similar to how uh, a resin-based or plastics 3D uh, printing platform would create a, a, a plastic model. And as I mentioned before, there's a temporary matrix to hold the cells in place at first, but over time they'll generate their own extracellular matrix. And what we end up with is a completely 100% cellular model. Uh, the bioprinting uh, is done directly on the transwell of a 24-well co-culture plate. Uh, so the only area where the cells touch an artificial surface is just at the bottom along that transwell. And the key for the bioprinter is it allows us to place specific cells in a specific location in the XYZ plane. So this cartoon with different colors uh, is a theoretical concept of how you could place uh, different bioinks or even maybe green might be a, a matrix only to create a, a cavity in the three-dimensional space to create a, a tissue-like architecture. The other point to make here is that uh, this is a very reproducible and scalable process. So it actually only takes about 30 minutes with the automated bioprinter platform to create these tissues. But there's a lot that goes into the uh, creation of the tissue recipe in the beginning of the front end and the care and feeding of these on the back end. Um, and so there I just want to point out that um, in addition to the, the, the synergy between the engineers and the biologists at Organovo, uh, there's quite a lot of... Um, uh, resources that go into uh, manufacturing these tissues and to quality assurance so that we can produce uh, the same sort of performance in the tissue uh, month after month and year after year. The other thing I want to mention here is I did mention diseased uh, human cells as an input. That's something we're just starting to work on. To that end, we've set up a subsidiary of uh, Organovo called Samsara Biosciences that allows us to source directly from disease patients. So 
a future development may be we, we may be able to create tissues where the donor cells come from uh, donors who are at various stages along that NAFLD sort of pathway. And that's a very exciting uh, development to look for from us in the future. So now I'm going to focus on the composition of the human liver tissue that we're going to talk about today. Uh, what we call the base model is comprised of primary hepatocytes, primary endothelial cells, and primary stellate cells. We do have the option of adding in Cooper cells. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, when we bioprint, we actually end up with a fully human multicellular structure. That's a close-up image of a top-down view of that 24-well uh, co-culture uh, insert. So it gives you a sense of the scale. It's a couple millimeters uh, in dimension on the X and Y plane and about a half millimeter thick on the Z plane. It's comprised of, of over a million cells. So the schematic here gives you a sense of how that tissue sits uh, on the uh, transwell membrane and there's some degree of compartmentalization that is imposed by the bioprinting uh, algorithm. So what we create is a non-parenchymal compartment that's comprised of the endothelial cells and the stellate cells and a parenchymal compartment that's comprised of the hepatocytes. And in the cases where we uh, add in the Cooper cells, those are also located in the hepatocyte region. So what the bioprinter does is it allows us to create uh, these compartments, and that in turn allows us to recreate some of the uh, microenvironment and some of the cell-cell signaling that goes on in, in a native tissue. And the key here is that by doing that, we uh, can show that we have sustained function and viability uh, over quite a long period of time with these in vitro tissue models. So I'm going to summarize quite a lot of work, uh, some of which is published, uh, that, goes in, that went into the characterization of the liver tissue model. Uh, so the top left um, is a, an immunohistochemistry image where E. cadherin staining is in green, showing nice uh, cellular junctions between the adjacent hepatocytes and albumin is in red, uh, showing uh, albumin um, generation by those hepatocytes. The middle panel shows uh, what's going on in the non-panorenchymal region. So in red, we've stained with CD31, an endothelial cell marker. And one point I want to make here is that although we don't create a, a, a incomplete vasculature in this model uh, with our, our bioprinting platform, the endothelial cells do undergo a degree of self-organization. They do form lumen-like structures. Uh, within that non parenchymal compartment. And empirically, if we don't get the health or the ratio of those endothelial cells just right, the tissue kind of collapses on, the, on itself. So we have this picture that the um, non parenchymal compartment and that organization of the endothelial cells gives the tissue some kind of uh, a degree of porosity, uh, which facilitates diffusion of uh, nutrients in and out of the tissue, waste products, and, and uh, any sort of test article. As well, uh, we're going to focus today on the role of the hepatic stellate cells in fibrosis. Uh, so I just want to point out here we're uh, staining in, in green uh, the Desmond positive hepatic stellate cells, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. The electron micrograph on the right shows uh, some degree of the organization of the hepatocytes in our tissue. So that we do see evidence of nice adherence junctions between adjacent hepatocytes. And once again, we don't claim to have a full biliary tree, but we do see evidence of biocanaliculi forming between the hepatocytes. Across the bottom is uh, just some of the characterization data showing uh, that uh, longevity of the tissue. So here we're looking at overall uh, cell viability within the tissue by monitoring ATP, or overall uh, production of albumin from the hepatocytes by measuring uh, albumin levels that are secreted into the supernatant or measuring uh, metabolic activity by giving uh, the tissues a, a CYP3A4 substrate and looking at production of its um, uh, uh, product, hydroxymedazolam. And with all three of these readouts, you can see that in the bioprinted context, we have good sustained uh, function and viability going out at least to four weeks. Uh, we can go out uh, quite a bit longer for some applications, whereas in contrast, the equivalent donor hepatocytes placed into standard uh, 2D culture uh, tend to kind of peter out over the course of a couple weeks. As well, on the metabolic side, we get sustained basal function of CYP3A4 as well as uh, sustained inducibility by rifampicin out to 28 days. And once again, I'll refer you to the published data for more of the basic characterization of the model. So I mentioned already uh, the stellate cell um, activation, and this is an early experiment. This is actually done before we had created the uh, final um, recipe for our liver tissue model, but it was an early observation that, that sort of set the stage for some of the work we're going to talk about today and also emphasizes uh, the fact that cells behave very differently in the 3D 
uh, architecture of a, of a tissue than they do in a 2D um, uh, cell culture. And so in this case, we're looking at hepatocell, sorry, um, stellate cells that were cultured in 2D that showed a good degree of stellate activation based on their alpha SMA staining signal. So that's the brown color. When we bioprinted the uh, and this is actually just bioprinted as a mixture of endothelial and stellate, so, so sort of mimics that non-prinkable component of the final liver product. Uh, but in that context, in this early experiment, the, the scientists observed even within a few days that uh, the alpha SMA staining starts to go away, suggestive of the cells, of the stellate cells regaining quiescence in the 3D environment. Uh, and as a control, they dissociated the tissue, replated those on um, under standard conditions, and saw that the uh, stellate cells were indeed viable and they were able to reactivate. So this kind of sets the stage for being able to do some of the um, fibrosis studies we're going to talk about today, showing that uh, that 3D tissue context promotes quiescent of the stellate cells, but then they can be reactivated. So before we go into the disease model, I do want to mention that there's quite a bit of work that we've done, and some of it's covered in some of those earlier webinars in the area of uh, drug-induced liver injury and metabolism and uh, other sorts of applications. But for today, we're really going to focus on these disease models and looking at some of the um, fibro fibrosis, steatosis, and inflammation phenotypes that we can induce uh, in this model. And once again, just kind of preview where we're going, uh, we've got the, the model where we've uh, placed hepatocytes, endothelial cells, stellate cells, and kupfer cells in the 3D uh, microenvironment. They uh, interact with each other. And what we're going to show is that we can produce a steatosis phenotype, inflammatory phenotypes, and uh, fibrotic phenotypes that, that are very reminiscent of the NAFLD progression. And this in turn allows us to work with uh, our customers to potentially evaluate candidate therapeutic molecules or biomarkers that might be in the area of mo metabolic modulators or anti-inflammatories or antifibrotics. So some of this work is actually published, and this is work done by a very talented graduate student named uh, Leah Nerona. She's wrapping up her dissertation uh, in, in Paul Watkins' group at UNC. Uh, and I would refer not only to her publication, but also one of those earlier recorded webinars for a more in-depth characterization of this work. I'm just going to give a kind of an overall summary. Uh, but the way uh, she approached it is, is, is thinking about our model and the sort of adverse outcome pathway uh, of, of inducing fibrosis, uh, in, in this case with either inducing chronic hepatocellular injury, in this case with some small molecules, or inducing stellate cell activation directly with TGF-beta. And the concept here is we've got all the right cell types and the right architecture, and we can observe um, potentially at the tissue level uh, the collagen act deposition that, that is characteristic of fibrosis. So her work used a methotrexate as a fibrotic inducer. It's known to cause fibrosis in a subset of patients. As well, I mentioned TGF-beta, a proto prototypical fibrogenic cytokine. And finally, thioacetamide, which is used to generate uh, rodent fibrosis models. In this study, uh, she used our standard uh, 3D uh, bioprinted liver tissue. So this does not actually have the Cooper cells included in it, and performed a 7 to 14 day exposure at two different doses. So initially, uh, the, the basic characterization looked initially at hepatocyte injury or hepatocyte health. We're just showing LDH release here as a marker for hepatocyte injury. And the observation was that the molecules MTX or TAA that would be suspected to induce a fibrotic phenotype through uh, hepatocellular damage did show some evidence of damage uh, relatively early within the first week or so of the study. And that increased uh, starting uh, quite a bit in the second week, whereas the TGF-beta treatment was largely quiescent in terms of any sort of damage marker. Uh, likewise, with albumin, we didn't see a dramatic drop off in albumin. Uh, with the exception of the high dose of TAA appears to drop off both the albumin and the LDH. And what you'll see uh, later is that it does look like we've really caused overt uh, toxicity in that high dose of TAA to the hepatocytes. Similarly, we looked at gene expression. Uh, here we're just showing collagen and alpha SMA as a proxy for the uh, stellate cell uh, activation. And again, what we can see is some evidence that there's an increase uh, at the mRNA level uh, with these treatments. Um, so we did see some hints, but what was really exciting then was looking at the histology. Uh, and this is uh, actually uh, images captured from the end of the experiment after 14 days. And the bottom line here is what we see is we see different um, patterns of fibrotic deposition, and, and some of those patterns uh, seem to reflect the clinical uh, in, in, uh, phenotypes. So starting with vehicle, 
Uh, over time, uh, our tissues do show a slight increase in uh, collagen deposition and other extracellular matrix components over time as the tissue matures. It's important to remember that this is a, a living tissue. It does have um, change over time. But the key here is then with these inducers, you see an increase in that fibrotic deposition. Uh, so looking first at TGF beta, what we see often is an increase in the uh, degree of fibrotic deposition first along that um, transwell interface. And that's where you see some of the increase in the, in the control tissue. Uh, so we believe the stellate cells that, that happen to be there uh, may be uh, activated or prone to activate based on their proximity to that artificial surface. But what we reproducibly see with TGF beta, and you'll see some more data later in this talk, is that uh, we start to see some more uh, fibrotic deposition inside the tissue with higher doses or later time points. Uh, with methotrexate or TAA in this initial study, um, we saw a more fibrotic deposition, and it seemed to initiate from different locations. So with methotrexate, we reproducibly see uh, a degree of fibrotic deposition that, that seems to be uh, prevalent in the uh, non-parenchymal region. That's uh, indicated NF or, or nodular fibrosis in this image. We also see evidence of what looks very much like bridging fibrosis, so strands of collagen crossing the hepatocyte zone uh, to bridge some of those non-parenchymal zones, uh, reminiscent of what you see in a clinical sample. And then finally with TAA, we saw more widespread uh, collagen deposition, both in the non-parenchymal region and in the hepatocyte region. And we see uh, what looks like a very reminiscent uh, of entrapped hepatocytes being really engulfed uh, by that uh, excess scarring. One other point I want to make from Leah's publication is, is that she did characterize uh, the um, pattern of uh, cytokines uh, generated from these treatments. And uh, like the histology, we see some different patterns of cytokine production. As one example, um, if we look at uh, the pro-inflammatory cytokine IL-6, that kind of stands out in this heat map. We see an increase over time, going from left to right out to day 14, uh, with the MTX and the TAA treatments. As well as within some of those treatments, we see some evidence of a dose dependence, so uh, more uh, IL-6 generated from the higher dose. And that is in contrast to what we see with a TGF beta activation, where we're uh, more directly stimulating stellate cell activation, and so maybe uh, coming in from a slightly different pathway from the hepatocellular damage pathway, and we just don't see quite as much. But there is some degree of IL-6 upregulation uh, over time. So I'm going to uh, switch gears now and talk about some recent data. Um, so after that work was published, uh, our internal team, uh, which is the commercial services team led by Candace Grundy, uh, did some additional work to sort of develop this as a, as a potentially uh, viable application for our customers. And the idea was to use TGF beta, since it's a very well understood pathway, um, to generate uh, some new readouts and some more quantitative readouts, as well as at the end I'm going to show some proof of concept for being able to modulate the pathway. And so we're going to step down the TGF beta pathway and show the phenotypes that can be generated by stimulating this pathway in our model. So first looking at what happens after receptor engagement when you treat with TGF beta, the first step is really a TGF beta uh, receptor activation of phosphorylation leading to phosphorylation of the SMADs, the downstream messenger. In our tissue, if we uh, create lysates after TGF beta treatment, we can indeed see an increase in phosphorylation of that second messenger. Stepping further down the pathway, a consequence of, of uh, SMAD phosphorylation is ultimately generation of a pro-fibrotic transcriptional uh, program. And one of those uh, downstream targets is alpha-SMA, that marker that we've already shown for uh, stellate cell activation. So here we're looking at dose-dependent increase in activation of stellate cells, as indicated by the alpha-SMA staining in red. Uh, and the quiescent uh, Desmond staining in green uh, begins to be uh, diminished. And again, once you, what you can see is with TGF beta treatment, there's uh, initially an increase from uh, the edge where we see a degree of uh, stellate cell um, uh, activation from the beginning of the experiment. But if you zoom in on these images, you can uh, reproducibly see uh, a significant increase in stellate cell activation uh, within the non-parenchymal compartment of the tissue as well. So again, looking at the transcriptional program that's activated by TGF beta, uh, we assessed uh, TIMP1 tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases. It's a biomarker that's uh, being used uh, in uh, in vivo uh, and, and, and in some experiment, uh, uh, research level uh, clinical studies, uh, and it is increased 
in the serum in fibrotic disease. What it does is it sort of tips the balance towards increased extracellular matrix deposition by inhibiting uh, the MMPs. And what we can see in our model is that we sample supernatants at different time points after TGF-beta induction. We do see an increase in TIMP1 in the supernatant. Uh, here we're simply showing a dose response at day seven after treatment. Uh, but you can see clearly that there is a dose responsive uh, increase in TIMP1 in the supernatant. Moving forward to uh, looking directly at collagen deposition, uh, either by trichrome staining or I'll show next Picrocerius red, we also see that dose dependent increase uh, in collagen deposition, which starts at the edge but then migrates towards the center of the tissue uh, in those non parenchymal regions where the stellate cells are located. Once again, the Picrocerius red shows a similar sort of uh, deposition pattern. And if we zoom in, we can see some uh, foci that are starting to form inside the tissue. And we really decided to focus in on this. Uh, subsaturating dose, 3 nanograms per mil, uh, for doing the next experiment, which is a proof of concept to see can we um, prevent this uh, phenotype from occurring in our tissue by treating with a known fibromodulatory agent. So for that experiment, we chose a galunacertib. It's a Lilly compound that's actually in phase two trials for hepatocellular carcinoma, but there's been some evidence published that shows that there's a potential for modulation of pulmonary and hepatic fibrosis with this molecule, and the key here is it's uh, an inhibitor of um, the TGF-beta receptor 1 phosphorylation activity. Uh, so by treating with this, we can block that initial step in the signal transduction pathway. And indeed, in our model, we show evidence of that. So for this first study, we actually did a, a treatment regimen where we co-dose with TGF-beta simultaneously with the kinase inhibitor as a first pass to look at whether we can uh, modulate the phenotype. And what you can see, again, this is a, a snapshot at one period of time. This is day seven, uh, an induction in SMAD phosphorylation by the TGF-beta treatment, and that's clearly prevented by co-dosing with the kinase inhibitor. Stepping down the pathway and looking at TIMP1 secretion, we see the same phenomena. So we see a nice increase in the TGF-beta alone treatment, and the co-treatment uh, completely ameliorates that TIMP1 secretion. And once again, this is a seven-day uh, snapshot. Looking to the histology, uh, for this we're actually looking at the 14-day time point. What we can see is that uh, same increase in, in uh, collagen deposition, both at the edge of the tissue and starting to creep into the uh, uh, middle with uh, TGF-beta alone, and then the codosine seems to completely prevent that. And you can see that a little bit better in these zoomed Im images. And uh, one assay that we've uh, started to use is that with the picrocerius red staining, we can take um, an adjacent slice from the uh, fixed tissue block and extract the picrocerius red and read it on a plate reader. So from the same study, uh, slices that would be adjacent to those we used to create these histology images, uh, we quantitate the picrocerius red and once again we can see that uh, increase in the TGF-beta alone treatment that is completely prevented by codosine with the kinase inhibitor. So I'm going to summarize this section just by noting that uh, we have the ability with this model to model tissue level biology and induce disease phenotypes, so uh, I talked about an induced fibrosis phenotype, and that allows us then to measure clinically relevant biomarkers, and the histological visualization allows us to uh, look at disease progression, as well as we can look at uh, mechanistic pathway signaling in this model, and so uh, what I just showed you is proof of concept to start to evaluate therapeutic candidates that can modulate the disease state. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn uh, the presentation over to Alice to share with you some exciting new data. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second portion of today's webinar. My name is Alice Chen, and I'm the Associate Director of R&D here in Tissue Applications at Organovo. And to, to extend today's discussion on 3D tissues for modeling disease states in the human liver, I'd now like to pivot slightly to introduce you to some of our early work in modeling non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In particular, I'm using XVIV as the base model for inducing steatosis through dietary means and its progression to inflammation and fibrosis as seen in NASH. So the work that I'm going to present to you today was actually done by some very talented researchers we have on our staff here, Dr. Dwayne Carter and Dr. Rhiannon Hardwick. Now, as introduced earlier, the need for a more predicted model of NASH is driven not just by its growing epidemic profile, but also the relatively silent nature of this disease. 
having an in vitro accessible system with the ability to model the complexity and the chronicity of NASH would enable advancement on key inflection points and needs in the field, including the discovery of therapeutics to stop the progression of NAFLD and or reverse NASH, the identification of biomarkers to non-invasively delineate NASH from steatosis, and finally, enable parallel drug safety assessment in normal versus diseased backgrounds. Now, to mimic development of the human condition, we induced steatosis via a nutrient overload approach analogous to Western diets. Specifically, treatment of 3D liver tissues with increasing concentrations of the free fatty acid, palmitic acid, induces the formation of putative lipid droplets that resemble those of native state of steatosis, as shown here at the top, by H&E staining. These lipid vesicles are macro and microvesicular in nature and stain positive for the lipid droplet-associated protein perilipin-5, and that's shown at the bottom here. To confirm lipid content in these vesicles, we then stain for oil red O. And here you can see that increasing doses of palmitic acid results in increased lipid accumulation as visualized by the red staining. And here you can see magnification of some of these tissues up at the upper right. This was confirmed by quantification via morphometric analysis in the plot below. To model inflammation, we then incorporated Kupfer cells to the base model, as you can see here and stimulated with fatty acids in conjunction with the prototypical inflammatory inducer, lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. The response is depicted in the center panel where we observe significant stellate cell proliferation and activation, reminiscent of native NASH shown here on the right. Specifically, we observe an increase in Desmin and alpha SMA double positive cells and alpha SMA single positive cells. And this is all in contrast to the relatively quiescent state of vehicle controls shown here on the left. Stimulation with LPS in immune competent tissues leads to detectable inflammatory cytokine release, as you can see here by TNF alpha and IL-1 beta. This is all shown by ELISA analysis. And you can see that incorporation of Kupfer cells alone results in detectable cytokine activity, which is further exacerbated upon exposure to palmitic acid and LPS, resulting in roughly 12 and 8-fold induction of TNF-alpha and IL-1-beta relative to vehicle controls, respectively. Consistent with this inflammatory response, these tissues exhibit increased collagen deposition and evidence of fibrosis, as shown here in trichrome staining in blue. And so on the far right is an example of native NASH, characterized by prominent lipid accumulation, as shown here by the yellow arrows, as well as fibrosis, which is labeled by the letter F here. And we can see this both in mass and in a pericellular manner down here. In the center panel, you can see that we've induced a phenotype that's reminiscent of native NASH. And specifically, we also observe lipid accumulation and fibrosis in similar patterns. However, we do note that there are some subtleties here, namely that there seems to be less fat compared to native controls, and clearly some, some areas of overt cell stress. And these things lead us to believe that we have some work to do yet in titrating the induction protocol. The goal is really to achieve a more controlled, low-grade inflammation that is chronic and more closely mimics native disease onset. Nevertheless, we're pretty encouraged by this pilot work, and we've definitely got some ideas about where to head next. To summarize then, XVIV liver is a 3D multicellular bioprinted tissue of the human liver that retains viability and function for four weeks or more in vitro. Key to this really is the functional longevity of this model, which holds promise for modeling chronic conditions involving multiple cell types in the liver, such as NASH. And today I presented some positive preliminary evidence of model feasibility, 
including the induction of steatosis via nutrient overload, as well as inflammation and progression to fibrosis as assessed by stellate cell activation, detectable cytokine release, and notable collagen deposition, all of which are characteristic of NASH. We are certainly optimistic and encouraged by this pilot work, but I'd say that it's a fairly complex disease and one that we want to make sure we get right, so there's quite a bit of work that remains ahead of us. To give you an idea of what we're thinking, current and future work include refinement of the conditions and timing around induction of steatosis and inflammation, as well as understanding donor differences for the various cell types and their individual contributions to disease progression. Importantly, we'll certainly look to the clinical phenotype to guide model development by taking a closer look at the genomic and proteomic profiles of the in vitro model versus patient disease tissues. And finally, the key focus here is that in the longer term, we want to aim towards modulation of the disease progression in vitro. Great. Thank you, Alice. We'll now begin the question and answer segment of the webinar. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Let's go ahead and get started. So the first question here uh, from the audience relates uh, to the questions as to what happens to the tissue after bioprinting. Is the, uh, a relatively static model, or do you see cells proliferating, moving around through the tissue? And also another uh, question that's related to that, what happens to the temporary matrix after bioprinting? Is it removed by the cells? Uh, those are great questions. Um, <clears throat> so I believe I, I, I mentioned in, in the slide showing the bioprinted process that the, the matrix is engineered to sort of be displaced over time uh, in, in normal tissue culture. Um, and that's probably uh, spontaneous. We probably don't require cells um, metabolizing anything that's really uh, more engineered into the structure of that matrix. And secondly, um, those non-parenchymal and parenchymal compartment separation that we set up in the tissue, um, there is some degree of, of, I would say, blending in the sense that some of the uh, stellate cells especially can migrate out a bit. But to a large extent, those um, compartments stay static over time. Uh, what does happen, though, is especially in an induced uh, fibrosis study, but when you have um, some pathology going on, sometimes you'll see an increase in the amount of that um, migration out of the tissue. Great. Uh, so another question uh, related to the liver fibrosis model. Does the fibrosis model contain Kupfer cells? Uh, any uh, comment as to if they do or, or if they are or are not included, or what are the relative effects of Kupfer cells? Yeah, that's also a, a very active area of investigation. So all the data that I showed uh, in the fibrosis section was done in the base model. So we believe that there's a lot going on uh, with regard to cytokine signaling coming from the stellates and possibly some of the other cell types. But indeed, we are exploring uh, the role of Kupfer cells when we include them, and that's a work going on in that same academic co collaboration. Uh, I believe some of that work will be published in the coming months uh, with, with Leah Nerona from, from the Watkins group, uh, and, and it does look like um, Kupfer cell inclusion is, is going to probably modulate the phenotype. It may have a, um, a, a role in um, the compensation or homeostatic response to some of those damaging uh, signals early on, uh, but look for that data to come in the coming months. Uh, so another uh, technical question here uh, regarding both models, the uh, NAFLD NASH model and the fibrotic model, how long have you kept those uh, two models in culture? So speaking first for the, the fibrotic model, um, we've really focused on being able to create the phenotype uh, within a, a week or two, and then that gives us an, an additional week or two to start investigating whether it's a reversible or not under various conditions or with various treatments. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, the, the basic tissue characterization, we've taken it out uh, six weeks or longer, but for kind of routine use, we'll typically do most of our studies within a four-week time frame. And I'll chime in here on the NASH side. The data that I showed you today, the proof of concept data, was really done uh, 
over a disease induction time frame of 21 days. Now this is a first pass attempt at building the disease. Certainly we're now looking at refining conditions around both the steatosis and the inflammation steps so that we can find the appropriate balance in inducing uh, onset of the disease, the severity of the disease, and retention of the disease phenotype such that we can really maximize the window of opportunity downstream for the actual application and drug testing and modulation studies. So again, here we induced for roughly 21 days. We know that we can go out to 28 days, likely longer, though we didn't explore there. Uh, and in the longer term, we hope to be able to induce the disease in less than 21 days, such that we could have one to two weeks and possibly three weeks to actually uh, conduct modulation studies. That's great. Thank you. Uh, another technical question here. Uh, do you observe any lot-to-lot -lot variation with different hepatocyte donors? And if so, how do you control for that? Yeah, that's another uh, very good question. So we do see differences between hepatocyte donors. Um, and I think I alluded to the, the fact that we're actively exploring uh, what differences might be set up by sourcing from, from disease donors. But with regard to the, the currently um, commercially available models that start out from healthy donors, uh, the way we uh, sort of control for that is I think I mentioned that, that we have a rather large manufacturing and quality assurance group. Uh, so there's quite a few assays that are run during the qualification phase to make sure that any new donors that we would include in the tissue, when they're included in the tissue, uh, perform uh, within a, a standard um, range across a variety of assays, including some tox assays and, and uh, that basic characterization I showed at the beginning. Okay, another question from the audience here. Uh, in the NASH model, do you look at fibrosis by trichrome or serous red staining? And have you tried to set up the model using NASH patient cells? Ah, oh, that's a great question. So the data that I showed you today is certainly by trichrome staining. Um, we can also stain with serious red and quantify that way. Um, and also look at gene expression for key um, fibrosis related genes. And then the second question around using patient samples, um, we're collaborating with uh, a group at UCSD, Dr. David Brenner's lab, um, and his team there who have access to Biobank so that we can source biopsy proven patient samples in order to carry out some of the genomic and proteomic analyses. Great. Um, I've got several questions here from the audience broadly talking about um, inhibiting or modulating the, the NASH phenotype with different uh, therapeutic modalities. Uh, and I know, Alice, you haven't yet uh, done that work, uh, but any comments on what what type of inhibitors or how you might structure that uh, in, the, in the future to try to reverse or, or to prevent the, the NASH phenotype from developing? Yeah, certainly. The two of the prominent ones in the literature uh, that we're interested in testing is our pioglitazone and perhaps ASK1 inhibitors. Uh, but this is really an area where we might be interested in talking to some partners to start getting some ideas about what might make sense to test in our model to really be able to validate that the disease has been appropriately induced and that we, we can find evidence of actual modulation. Great, thank you. Uh, this question would be for Jeff, uh, an audience member here is curious to know um, a little bit more about those differences in the fibrotic patterning that uh, was mentioned for the various inducers. Any comments on, as to why we see different patterns develop in the tissue? So that's uh, still an area of, of active investigation, but uh, the biggest difference we saw, of course, was between TGF-beta and uh, either TA on the one hand or MTX on the other hand. And as I think I mentioned, those might be expected to induce fibrosis from slightly different pathways. One is initiated by the hepatocellular damage, and the other is more directly activating um, the stellate cells. And so we are exploring that, but I think that that would be expected that uh, there could be multiple overlapping signal transduction pathways that may be differentially engaged by those, uh, and in different cell types that may be differentially engaged by those different inducers. Thank you for that. Um, okay, here's another question about the NASH induction. Um, I think, Alice, you touched on this at least a bit, but the question is, uh, how long does it take to induce steatosis in the system? 
what concentrations of palmitic acid were used. And I guess I would additionally add, um, what sorts of things are you looking at to potentially speed up that process of disease induction? Yeah, absolutely. That's, those are really relevant questions. So the work that I showed you today was um, preliminary in that we used a low and a high dose of palmitic acid um, and the disease induction occurred over the course of 21 days. And if you step back and think about this, really, we don't, we, ideally, we wouldn't want to wait 21 days in order to see a phenotype. So we're trying a couple of other things now that make sense based on what happens in patients. We're exploring other fatty acids, such as oleic acid, either alone or in combination with palmitic acid and other simple sugars such as fructose, which we know plays key roles in the synthesis of triglycerides in vivo. So titrating both of these into the existing system of um, already a high glucose background and hoping that we can induce a steatotic condition, preferably in the seven to 14 day range um, and inflammation from there and then trying to optimize a window where we have at least two weeks to be able to test compounds to see if we can um, either uh, drive regression of the disease or complete um, uh, reversion of the disease. So it's really beginning work, but we're hoping that we can shift the induction again to the first seven to 14 days such that we have a, a viable two week window for testing. Good, thank you for that. All right, another question here. Uh, what other tissues can be modeled uh, with the XV technology other than liver? So right now we have, uh, in addition to the liver model described today, we have a commercially available kidney model. Uh, and um, some of that work, uh, the characterization of that was also published recently. You can, you can check on our website. Um, that publication for this audience, uh, it may be worth knowing that publication does indicate the preliminary that we can induce a fibrosis phenotype in that model as well, but it's primarily been positioned for toxicology testing. And then with regard to other tissue models, um, we've done a variety of, of work with different partners, um, uh, but right now the, it's the kidney and the liver that are available commercially. Good. Um, another question about cell types, have you tried to introduce monocytes or macrophages into the model? Um, I can take that. So uh, that's another active area of discussion with uh, various partners. So it is something we would like to um, continue to work on is, is progressing beyond uh, incorporating the, the Cooper cells, the resident macrophage in liver, to ask whether we can potentially model infiltration of, of other immune cell types in the model. Uh, today we don't have any data that we can share publicly with that, but it is an area that we're obviously very interested in modeling. Okay, we've got Time for one more question here. This one is for Alice, uh, kind of a bigger picture question. What would you say are the key challenges in the study of NASH in terms of existing preclinical models? Great, and a very relevant question. So I guess I would say that the study of NASH has traditionally utilized rodent models, which have certainly been effective at answering specific questions based on model choice. But there are certainly key limitations which include that rodent models are costly and time consuming to uh, induce the disease. They don't fully recapitulate the human condition. And we know from more recent publications that there's surprisingly little overlap in rodent and human gene expression with disease progression. And that compound success in rodent models does not completely translate to success in the clinic. And then on the in vitro side, I'd say that current 2D cell culture models are challenged by some fairly obvious points. Number one being that there's significant experimental variability. There's also uh, a rapid loss of cellular phenotypes, particularly for primary cell cultures. We know that these systems rarely include all relevant cell types. And then finally, they lack longevity necessary to induce some of these more chronic and complex diseases, which then means that we have a fairly limited window for experimentation and study. Great. Thank you very much to both of our speakers. That's all the time that we have for our webinar today. Please look for our follow-up email with a link to view the recording of today's webinar once available on our website, organovo.com.
I would also like to point out that Organovo offers fibrosis induction and modulation services using our XV 3D bioprinted liver tissue. If you're interested in exploring this further, please check out our website for more information. And on behalf of Alice, Jeff, myself, and the team here at Organovo, thank you very much for tuning in and have a great rest of your day.